Okay, people, so I'm a literature teacher who is uh, slightly bored during uh, lockdown. And uh, I want to talk to you today for quite some time about Peter Redding's poem, Citation, which has been set by Cambridge uh, as an IGCSE exam poem. Now, in many ways, this looks like a simple poem to read and dispose of. Um, but it's a difficult poem, I think, actually, to write about in any essay. And yet, that's what, of course, we have to do in exams. We have to write about the poem and the words on the page. But before we look at the words on the page, let's very briefly think about some context or things around the poem. Now, firstly, the poet Peter Redding, whose work I've always enjoyed. And I'll mention only what I think might be valuable for this poem, Citation. Well, Redding was a talented, quite radical and quite grumpy English poet who died only very recently, I think in 2011. He was very well known for his socially responsible political poetry, which had a sort of left of centre political feel. But he also wrote nature poetry, notably poems about humankind's sometimes destructive effect on living things. He was also a keen amateur naturalist, insofar as he was an enthusiastic bird watcher. Now this fact might be relevant to this poem because I personally read Cetacean less like a traditionally beautiful or imaginatively creative piece of poetry and more like a deliberately plain piece of amateur naturalist prose writing. Yes, I actually think that the poem reads very much like the notebook notes of somebody, probably the poet, who goes on a whale watching expedition off the coast of America and successfully sees blue whales. The largest, the largest animal that has ever existed on the planet. Now, the whole poem is descriptive. It's a descriptive poem. It simply describes, in chronological order, what can be seen between the moment a blue whale surfaces to the moment it flukes and dives. And by the way, fluking is the ultimate experience that blue whale watchers want to see, as it's very rare. And when a whale flukes, this means that just before diving, the tail fins, or flukes, rise fully above the surface of the ocean and then sink with a bit of a splash. It's what whale watchers hope to see, this rare thing, because usually a whale's tail doesn't lift above the water before it dives, particularly a blue whale. Now I think, as I've said, that the whole poem is an amateur naturalist's record of what he sees. He's writing something down that he can return to later, as you might with a diary. Consequently, he describes everything in great detail using proper scientific terms. Dorsal fins, for example. And the whole tone or voice of the poem is very detached and understated or calm. It's the classic tone of the amateur scientist as he or she writes dispassionately and objectively about the creature they're viewing. Now this dispassionate stance that we see in Cetacean can be compared and contrasted with other poems in the Birds, Beasts and the Weather part of the Cambridge IGCSE Poetry Anthology. For example, in Cooper's The Poplar Field, Larkin's Coming and St Vincent Millay's The Buck in the Snow and in other poems, nature is always presented as something for the poet to possess, to learn from or to change his or her mood. For instance, in Larkin's Coming, Larkin hears a song thrush that brings spring, and this cheers up the poet. He uses the songbird for his own purposes. But in Redding's Cetacean, things are different. The blue whale exists for its own sake, as something worthwhile in its own right. Redding doesn't try to own it. He just objectively observes the blue whale, records it and walks away, satisfied that the whale's presence has been recorded. OK, so that's a bit of waffle around the poem, but let me now read the poem all the way through and then we'll perform a close reading of it line by line, maybe taking some notes. Now, notice when I read that I read Cetacean in a very flat voice with very little excitement or emotion. And this was how Redding himself read many of his own poems. And it seems especially appropriate for this poem, which is a simple, dispassionate set of notes 
on something observed in nature. So let's read it. Citation by Peter Redding. Out of Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco, Sunday, early, our vessel bowed to stern some 63 feet to observe blue whales. And we did, off the Farallons. They were swimming slowly and rose at a shallow angle. They were grey as slate with white mottling, dorsals tiny and stubby, with broad flat heads one quarter their overall body lengths. They blew as soon as their heads began to break the surface. The blows were as straight and slim as upright columns, rising to 30 feet in vertical sprays. Then their heads disappeared under water, and the lengthy rolling expanse of their backs hove into our view, about 20 feet longer than the vessel herself. And then the diminutive dorsals showed briefly after the blows had dispersed and the heads had gone under. Then they arched their backs, then arched their tail stocks ready for diving. Then the flukes were visible just before the creatures vanished, slipping into the deep again at a shallow angle. Now, as well as noting the unemotional, factual tone that I hope my reading achieved, we can also reflect upon the strange layout of the poem. How some lines aren't indented at all, but how others are, but to different degrees. Some look like they're indented by about half a centimetre, by, some by a centimetre, if you want to do it by measurements. Now, we could say something about this. Some readers think that the different verse paragraphs, most of which are long in terms of line length, but only three lines deep, mimic the look of the blue whales as they move. That could be the case, and you could mention that. I might also suggest the side-to-side -side chaos of the lines was perhaps caused by the rocking motion of the boat he was on as he tried to write in his notebook. In that case, it's as if the poem, as we see it, is a snapshot of that notebook. It's for you to have an opinion, and he's just reproducing, we're just seeing reproduced on the page, the back and forth movement, if you like, of the ship and the clumsiness of his writing in his notebook. OK, on to the poem. So the title, Citation, is actually a part of the poem, and you can, of course, comment upon it on the title. Redding doesn't call this poem Blue Whale, but rather he uses the scientific name for that order of marine mammals, the Cetacea, which includes dolphins, porpoises, whales. That he uses a scientific name is a clue that this might be, yes, a naturalist's poem, a factual piece on a whale sighting, and not what we traditionally consider to be a poem. Now let's move on to this first verse paragraph. Firstly, I'm calling them verse paragraphs, not stanzas, because they're not regular, like stanzas of a hymn or something like that. Look, this is three lines, this is three lines, this is three lines, this is all over the place, this is two lines, some are this long. Um, so I'm going to call them verse paragraphs, not stanzas. Now, this first verse paragraph here reads to me exactly like those sorts of bird watching or whale watching notes that an amateur naturalist might take down if he was wanting to properly record a site for future reference. Note how all important details of time and place are given meticulously. Out of Fisherman's Wharf, San Francisco, Sunday, early, our vessel bowed to stern some 63 feet to observe blue whales. And we did, off the Fanalons. Now look, the place is mentioned, the day, the time, early in the day, the length of the boat, <clears throat> and what they're going to do to observe blue whales. And then the revelation that they did, off the Fanalons, the islands. <clears throat> now this, if you read it, this first uh, verse paragraph, isn't really a complete sentence in English, but it rather reads like quickly written down notes, simple facts regarding the where, what, how, and when. Now, one interesting thing is the caesura, this dash or hyphen here. After it, we get the words, and we did see the whales, off the phalarons. <clears throat> 
Now, one very good teacher video here on YouTube suggests that this pause creates anticipation or excitement and that we could read those three words and we did with breathless excitement and we did. Now that's fine and in an essay you could mention that this is one way of interpreting it and that teacher's right. But I read even that and we did quite flatly in a matter-of-fact way without excitement again just as a detached objective naturalist might. Just this, we were going to observe blue whales, pause, and we did, off the Phalerons. Now, indeed, because we're told right at the beginning of this poem that Reading did see the whales, look, and we did, we're told right at the beginning of the poem, we saw the whales, I think any anticipation or suspense or excitement is fully removed from the poem. But it's for you to have an opinion and to state this in any essay. So you could read it as an excited statement. You could read it, as I do, as a flat statement. If you're aiming for maybe an A star, you might be able to say that different people could read it in different ways. Some people like this, some people like that. Anyway, let's move on. After setting the scene in this first paragraph, the rest of the poem, from here, pretty much until the end, is a very straightforward account of what happens from the first sighting of the whale to its disappearance, to their disappearance, sorry, at the end. Here, in the second verse paragraph, we get, they were swimming slowly and rose at a shallow angle. They were swimming slowly and rose at a shallow angle. Now what I'm interested in here is the way in which we get our first of many quite precise and simple adjectives and adverbs in this poem. We have slowly, an adverb, the whale swims slowly, and we have shallow angle. Shallow is an adjective describing the angle. Now, both adjectives and adverbs, as types of word, they are describing words, and they make the whole piece very descriptive, the whole poem very descriptive. Again, in a very simple manner, that might enable both Reading to later recall the scene, and to enable the reader to very clearly, and without drama, see the scene in our mind's eye. And this is where I think Citation is a good poem to compare with Tennyson's Kraken. Uh, Peter Redding's Cetacean is a poem about a real animal, the biggest that ever lived, and it's written in very plain scientific language and a very dull tone, perhaps, deliberately so. Whereas Tennyson's The Kraken, which is about a huge mythical sea monster, is told with a very great drama in the voice like that. Anyway, let's get back to this. Slowly and shallow are examples of many adjectives and adverbs that continue throughout this poem, and a very sensible thing for you to do as you read through this poem is perhaps highlight all of them, all of the adjectives and adverbs, um, and quote them as examples of language choice or diction that make this poem descriptive. So here, for example, you could highlight straight and slim. You could highlight not just uh, vertical sprays, the lengthy, rolling expanse of their backs. The diminutive dorsals showed briefly an adverb. All the way through this poem, there are lots of adjectives and adverbs which are very, very descriptive uh, words. Now, in this second line, look at this. We are told that the um, uh, whales themselves, the blue whales, were grey as slate, or as grey as slate. Now this is of course a simile, or a comparison made with words, but what I'm interested in here is how unimaginative, I think deliberately unimaginative, how unimaginative and even cliched the simile is. The simile as grey as slate is almost, I think, as dull as something like as white as snow. 
or as cold as ice, or as bold as a lion. These are very boring, often used or cliched similes. And if Redding, Redding was certainly a talented enough poet to be able to write very creatively if he wants to, but he uses these very boring similes. He wants to be precise. This is a naturalist or a scientist's poem. It is not a poet's poem in many, many ways. So this is a clue that Redding, a very talented poet, was doing this deliberately because he didn't want to create a very imaginative poem, but rather wanted to create a plain, simple, straightforward representation of what he sees. We get a similarly, deliberately unimaginative simile elsewhere in this poem. So in the third verse paragraph, I think, yeah, here, the blows, we are told, the blows uh, of water up through the blowhole of the whale were as straight and slim as upright columns. Again, this is a very boring, flat um, simile. It's plain description, not a flowery sort of creativity. And I think that Redding does this deliberately. It's not because he's not a good enough poet to think of anything better than uh, as white as snow, as grey as slate, as cold as ice, as straight as columns. It's that he wants to precisely create them, like almost a photograph. Anyway, back to the second verse, par uh, verse paragraph. The whales have white mottling, or dappling, or spots, a bit like on the side of a cow maybe, and they have tiny dorsals. Tiny dorsal fins of the sort that you find on the back of fish or marine animals like whales here. It's again, I think, useful to quote this word dorsal as um, another example of very precise scientific language. He actually uses the proper anatomical term. He doesn't say those cutesy little uh, finny type things on the back. He calls them dorsals. There's no nonsense in this poem. He says it as it is with the precise scientific language. And then this last line of the second verse paragraph is just another plain, simple statement of fact. They have broad he flat heads, one quarter their overall body length. But again, two adjectives, broad, flat. OK, now the third verse paragraph here, we can start steaming through this poem, continues in this manner with simple factual recording of what's being seen. We have that second unimaginative simile, as straight and slim as upright common, columns. Uh, and in there, we also have two very more simple adjectives, don't we? Straight and slim. And then we have more statistics. Like in the first section of the poem, we had the boat's length was some 63 feet. We've got another plain measurement. Here, the whale's uh, blows are 30 feet. They rise to 30 feet. Um, it's all again very precise, like a naturalist notebook might be expected to be, recording data, recording statistics. Now in the fourth verse paragraph here, there's even more of the same. We have the lengthy rolling backs. Again, this is simple descriptive language worth quoting. And then we have a very precise verb, hove. Their, the expanse of their backs hove into view. That's, that's a word like heave, isn't it? It comes from heave. And it sort of suggests the power, the slow, massive power as this beast heaves itself through the water. Again, it's a very precise choice of verb that describes the slow strength of the whale's movement. And it helps us to visualise, again, the slow power of this animal. He's describing things in such a way that we could reproduce them in a picture. It's a very photographic or imagistic poem. We can see exactly what's being described in our mind's eye. <clears throat> now again, um, there's another pause here, and I don't think it's for dramatic effect. And after it, he just gives another statistic. Their backs were about 20 feet longer than the vessel herself. So if the vessel was 63 feet, their backs were 83, uh, feet. Uh, again, nothing very exciting and poetic in that. It's just a simple statement of distance, of length. And so in the fifth verse paragraph, again, there's even more of the same flat, plain, 
clear and precise recording. Those diminutive or small, diminutive means small, um, those diminutive or small dorsals appear again. And again, anatomically correct language is used. We learn about tail stocks later on. Tail stocks, again, that's what a part of the whale is called. And he uses the proper anatomical, agreed, scientific term. It's like he knows what he's talking about. Also, as we move towards the end of this poem, let's look at this bit. Let me actually read this last couple of lines here. Even, even from here, actually, I want to, to highlight a particular word. And then the diminutive dorsal will show briefly after the blows are dispersed and the heads are gone under. Then they arch their backs. Then arch their tail stocks ready for diving. Then blah, 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 blah. It's very much like your English teacher probably tells you not to write a piece of narrative writing. Then and then and then and then. It's something you try to get children out of. That constant uh, habit of just saying this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. But Redding is a poet. He's a very talented poet, really good with his language. Why would he choose, if he wants to write a beautiful poem, to keep using then and then and then and then and then all over the place? I think it's just because he's recording it very quickly in a notebook. This is like the reproduction on a typed page of his notebook including the side-to-side -side moving of these lines that go in and out. So it's more evidence that these are notebook jottings rather than part of a pretty, pretty poem. And then finally, I say finally, I'm going to take a few more minutes, but finally, in those last two lines, the blue whales, they disappear into the ocean again. And I'll say just a couple of things here that might help you to have something to say about this end to the poem for any essay you want to write. Now, firstly, look at this. Let's read the end. Then the flukes were visible just before the creatures vanished, slipping into the deep again at a shallow angle. Now, I want to highlight these um, last few words. Shallow angle. Those four words. They repeat it. They're, they first appear at the very beginning of the poem when the whale appears at a shallow angle. You can see they're here. And then we get the whole poem of everything that happens. And at the end, they disappear into the deep again at a shallow angle. And so we can say that in many ways, the poem, in terms of its form or structure, has come full circle. Now, such a repeated phrase at the beginning and the end of a poem that comes back here at a shallow angle at the beginning and then at a shallow angle repeated again at the end of the poem you can call it an envelope line or an envelope phrase, but you don't have to use those poems in an IGCSE uh, essay if you don't want to. But if you want it to sound really clever, you could say that this is an envelope phrase because it appears at the beginning of the poem and the end. The poem pretty much starts with the whale appearing and ends with the whale disappearing in the same way at a shallow angle. So the whole poem encapsulates that short period of time between the whale emerging and the whale ex exiting in that same manner. So that's the first thing I wanted to draw your attention to as we finish this poem, that this shallow angle at the bottom is something that we heard about earlier on. It's an envelope line, brings the poem into a sort of circular shape. Now the second thing that I'd say about this poem at the end is the simple fact that it just ends here. And I think this is a good time to contrast this poem with other poems in the collection. Let's look at it. The whales disappear at a shallow angle. And at this point, the poem just dies, doesn't it? The poem just dies here with the whale disappearing. He could have gone on further. And it is worth contrasting this with other nature poems uh, that I mentioned earlier from this same Cambridge anthology. For example, Cooper's The Poplar Field or St. Vincent Millay's The Buck in the Snow. Those two poems are both of them divided into two sections. Look at this. The Buck in the Snow and Cooper's The Poplar Field, we could divide those poems into two sections. Now, in the first section of Cooper's The Poplar Field, if you've read it, is the setting of a scene. A scene is set in the first half of the poem. He presents this 
poplar field that used to be lovely, but that now has had all its poplars felled or cut down, and he's sitting there. That's the scene that's created. And then in the second part of his poem, he pauses after the scene and he reflects. He sits there with his hat in, head in his hand and he's very sad, he's very miserable. It changes his emotion as he muses upon his own mortality. Now the same structure is there in many of these poems in this anthology. We can think of uh, St Vincent Millay's Buck in the Snow, it's exactly the same. In the first part of uh, St Vincent, oh sorry you can't see that very well, in the first part of St Vincent Millay's poem um, a scene is set. There's a beautiful buck with its doe full of life and then it's lying dead on the ground. That's the scene that's uh, shown. Then in the middle of the poem there's a turn or sometimes called a volta after the uh, Italian word. And then in the second part of the poem, again, St. Vincent Millay reflects upon that scene that she has seen. She muses upon it and she starts to think about mortality, her own mortality, the strangeness of life and the strangeness of death. So that's many other nature poems. But in Peter Redding's citation here, we, we do not get that at all. We just get the scene. He paints the scene of the whale being there, then it disappears, and once it disappears, the poem finishes. Redding does not spend ages stroking his beard, and he did have a beard, um, doesn't, doesn't spend ages stroking his beard, reflecting on the scene, talking about the awe of nature, the mystery of the world, of living things. Uh, he doesn't reflect, as many people would if they were writing about blue whales, about how insignificant he feels as a human being in relation to this, the greatest animal that ever lived. He doesn't do anything like that. He just writes about the whale. and When it goes, it's allowed to swim off. And so what I think we can say about this poem is, Redding's poem is more generous, I believe, than Cooper's or St Vincent Millay's or some of the other ones, because those poets all see nature and they use it selfishly for themselves, to learn something for themselves. And they then put themselves, especially at the end of their poems, right at the heart of the poem. The poem doesn't become about um, the poplar trees anymore. Coupler makes it all about himself. But as we sometimes say, it's not all about me. Cooper's poem is all about me. St. Uh, Vincent, uh, St Vincent Millay's poem is, to an extent, all about her and humanity. Whereas Redding presents a blue whale and lets it do its own thing. When it disappears, he just lets it swim off. He doesn't use it for his own selfish human purposes. Nature and the things of nature have value in their own right in Redding's poem. And maybe he's actually saying then that um, nature, the things of nature, the great animals of nature, shouldn't be patronised uh, through flowery nature poetry. And maybe humans shouldn't put ourselves at the centre of things where nature is concerned. And perhaps the natural world, as environmentalists will often tell us, um, doesn't exist just for our own human pleasure. These things have value in their own right. So maybe we could even go so far as to say that this is a poem that's pro-nature, pro-the environment, but it's maybe anti-traditional nature poetry like Cooper's pastoral poem about the felled poplar trees. Maybe. Maybe. And that's that. We've reached the end now. I've reached the end of what I wanted to say. Now, I like this poem. I like it in itself as a poem. I like it because it lets the things of nature be themselves. And I like it because it contrasts beautifully with those other poems that I mentioned, which to me seem more selfish, but they're still wonderful poems in their own right. OK, that's it. I want to wish you great good luck with your studies uh, and remember to try to enjoy these poems. That's one very important thing you must try to do. Yes, get all the knowledge you need to write brilliant, brilliant essays, but you make sure you enjoy these poems. Thank you for listening.